Here we'll consider the neural basis of willpower. Willpower is something of an old-fashioned word that is not much used by neuroscientists these days, but I think it captures pretty well the idea that there is a source of motivation and drive, as well as commitment to a goal that helps us realize our intentions, even if having willpower alone is not enough. Obviously, we need to also have a goal in mind before we can be driven to fulfill that goal. In past sections, we raised the possibility that planning areas such as the rostrolateral and dorsolateral prefrontal cortex are likely to be involved in coming up with a plan or a goal, or even a stack of organized and sequenced subplans and subgoals. But the cingulo opercular circuit that links the very anterior portion of the insula with the dorsal anterior cingulate is very likely involved in the neural realization of task maintenance and the drive needed to stay on task so that we can see a plan through to its completion. First, let's learn a bit about what happens if this circuitry is knocked out. In one of the horrors of science, tens of thousands of frontal lobotomies were performed during the 1940s and 1950s. The word derives from lobe and otomy, which means to cut, so lobe cutting. It was invented in the 1930s by a Portuguese neurologist called Antonio Moniz, shown here. He actually got the Nobel Prize in 1949 for inventing this brutal method. In America, neurologists Walter Freeman and James Watts, shown here in an image from a 1941 article in the Saturday Evening Post, embraced and refined the method. It initially involved drilling a hole through the skull and sticking the leukotome device, shown here, into the brain and then letting the spikes at the end rotate, destroying a disc of tissue. Often they would drill six or more such holes to destroy as much frontal lobe connectivity as they could. Later, Freeman simply smashed metal rods, shown here, into the brain right about here above the eyelids and swept it back and forth to destroy axonal connections linking frontal areas to the rest of the brain. This was legitimized with the scientific sounding term transorbital lobotomy. Over 40,000 such operations were carried out in the 1940s and 50s by Freeman and others in the U.S. and over 17,000 in the U.K. The majority of the victims were women. Imagine you're a depressed woman in a hospital and Dr. Freeman comes in and destroys your frontal lobes because he thinks he knows best and you have been conditioned to trust your doctor. This is how Freeman described one of his patients, or, sh or should I say victims, a 29-year-old woman after giving her a frontal lobotomy. She became a smiling, lazy, and satisfactory patient with the personality of an oyster. She could no longer remember Freeman's name and again and again tried to pour coffee from an empty pot. He advised her parents to train her with ice cream as a reward and to smack her for punishment. Freeman proudly called the results of his procedure surgically induced childhood. He believed that after being put into a childlike state with this procedure, patients could be retrained using smacking and rewards to become healthy functioning adults again. But the data proved otherwise. The large majority of such patients had enduring personality damage primarily associated with apathy and a lack of initiative or willpower and a loss of inhibition. It's hard for me to believe that such a barbaric procedure was considered legitimate practice as recently as the 1950s and that Moniz got the Nobel Prize for inventing this cruel treatment. This, along with the infamous Tuskegee and Mengele experiments, provide all the evidence we will ever need that scientists alone cannot be trusted to do the right thing, even if they themselves believe that they're acting with the noblest of intentions. In large part, this is why science is now carried out under the supervision of internal review boards, and sometimes external review boards, that review experiments before they're allowed to proceed. Perhaps such review boards need to be introduced more broadly in our society, given the human tendency to act immorally when in positions of unchecked power. Let's put that grim history aside and now consider what happens if the dorsal anterior cingulate is activated artificially. Unlike a lobotomy or a cingulotomy, which destroys the circuitry and induces a loss of initiative or willpower, activating this intact circuitry in the right way should activate the functionality of the circuitry. This is the orange circuitry shown here. Recently, in the paper shown here, a neuroscientist called Joseph Parvizi at Stanford University stimulated the dorsal ACC of patients who have epilepsy. 
Here's the exact location where he stimulated the dorsal anterior cingulate with a very low amperage electrical current. In a moment, we'll watch a film clip of one such patient. There are two kinds of trials, one where Dr. Parvizi, in fact, does stimulate the dorsal ACC, and another control trial where he says that he does so, but in fact, he does not stimulate it. In the film clip, these are labeled sham for sham trials. Please pay attention to what the patient says about what he subjectively feels when his dorsal ACC is stimulated. Let me know what you feel. Okay. Yeah, my upper respiratory started kind of, my chest and respiratory system started getting kind of shaky, like it was wanting to um, go push itself out the door. Really? Okay. Okay. Did you feel any change in your emotion and mood? Well, not my emotion, but in my mood, I started getting this feeling like um, I was driving into a storm. That's the kind of feeling I got. It was almost like you're headed towards this storm that's on the other side of maybe a couple of miles away um, and you got to get across the hill. And all of a sudden you're sitting there going, how am I going to figure out how to get over that, through that? And that's the way my brain started functioning. Did it happen? Yeah, it's just about the same way as last time. And my chest never sits there and starts pounding like it's, you know, like you're a football player getting ready to go out and make a, try to make his first touchdown for the season or something. It's not that type of thing. It's more like this thing of trying to figure out your way out of how you're going to get through something. It's not a matter of how you're going to production-wise do something. Follow what I'm saying? Well, can you tell me a little bit more? Going through something, tell me a little bit more about that. What do you mean going Let's through? say um, if you knew you were driving your car and it was, if one of the tires was half flat and you're only halfway there and you had no other way to turn around and go back, you had to keep going forward, that type of a, you know, feeling you have, you're like, you're like, am I going to, you know, am I going to, get through this, why can't get through this? Was it negative or positive? It was it was more of a positive type thing of uh, push harder, push harder, push harder to try to get through this. And that's when my heart started my, my I don't know if you were reading my heart pulse rate? or anything or heart rate. Was it starting to go up at that time or okay uh, let's let's try it one more time if you don't mind. Is okay. this unpleasant? I don't find it at all. You don't find it unpleasant? No. Okay. Uh, do you think this time when I did it, was it stronger or the same? The same. The same. How about now? One, two, three. What happened? Nothing. You didn't feel it. That was incredibly interesting, wasn't it? What you will notice is that the patient had not only a psychological experience of willpower, namely of facing challenges and overcoming them, he had a bodily experience of increased heart rate and heavier breathing. This is not a coincidence because willpower is not only a psychological phenomenon, it's also a bodily phenomenon. In fact, some neuroscientists have argued that the right dorsal anterior cingulate is effectively the encephalization or cortical control center of the sympathetic nervous system. Outside of the central nervous system, which includes the brain and spinal cord, there is a peripheral nervous system that has two subcomponents, the sympathetic nervous system that prepares one for fight or flight, and the parasympathetic nervous system that is associated with rest and digest processes. The main idea is that the cortical activation of the right dorsal anterior cingulate cortex invokes the sympathetic nervous system so that we have the energy and physical power to enact our willed intentions and plans and have the energy and drive to overcome the obstacles that inevitably arise. In contrast, it may be that parts of the left anterior cingulate cortex contain neural circuits that realize an encephalization or cortical control center for the parasympathetic nervous system. The sympathetic nervous system may act as the gas to rev our engines so that we can get things done, and the parasympathetic nervous system may act as the brakes so that we can rest and digest. 
We can conclude from this that the dorsal anterior cingulate is not only part of a cognitive task maintenance circuit that we have been calling the cingulo opercular control network, it also activates the body to be ready for action so that plans and goals can be achieved. In the West, there are numerous biases that we are hardly aware of. One of these is that the mind is separate from the body. But as we can see here in the case of willpower, the will is as much about states of the body as it is about states of the mind.